Now with India's next national election only weeks away, a blockbuster interview in the best traditions of India today. What you're about to watch, Prime Minister Narendra Modi's 60-minute interview to India Today's chairperson and editor-in-chief Arun Puri, vice chairperson Kali Puri and group editorial director for publishing Raj Chengappa, where the Prime Minister speaks in the most detailed manner, openly, on a range of key domestic and international issues, apart from discussing in depth for the first time his unique management style. That's over the next 60 minutes, right here, exclusively on India Today. Blockbuster interview of the year. India Today's newsmaker for 2023. From elections to economy to AI. From Parivarvad to Modi's guarantee. Prime Minister's most detailed interview ever. The mega Modi interview. We're going to split up the various things that the Prime Minister has spoken about in this 60-minute blockbuster exclusive interview into politics, his way of doing things, the economy, national security and Modi's political style. And he, believe me, has answered questions across all of these wide-ranging topics over 60 minutes. The first question, let's dive straight into it and then we'll try and decode what he said. The Prime Minister was asked by India today, are you confident of scoring a hat-trick in 2024? What are the big issues that will determine the outcoming of this general election? Here's what the Prime Minister said. Regarding 2024, it is not a question of my confidence. The only thing in my hands is to give my everything in the service of the people. I'm trying to do this with utmost honesty and commitment. But today there is a consensus among the people, the experts, the opinion makers and friends from the media too that our country doesn't need a Mili Juli Sarkar or a hodgepodge government. We have lost 30 years due to instability resulting from Mili Juli Sarkars. People have seen the lack of governance, the appeasement politics, corruption in the era of Mili Juli Sarkars. This resulted in a loss of optimism and confidence among the people and gave a bad image to India in the world. So naturally, the choice of the people is the BJP. You just heard the Prime Minister use the word Mili Juli Sarkar three times in that first answer as to what he sees for 2024. The next question, the next question that we asked him, what is the Modi guarantee for the 2024 election? Remember, Modi ki guarantee has become the war cry, the catchphrase for the BJP going into this next big election cycle. Here is the Prime Minister's answer to India today. He said, for me, the guarantee is not mere words or election promises. It is the outcome of decades of my hard work. It is an expression of sensitivity towards society. When I talk about the guarantee, I bind myself to it. It doesn't let me sleep. It propels me to work harder. It leads me to give my everything for the people of the country. So please don't look for a dictionary meaning of guarantee is how the Prime Minister has answered that question about Modi key guarantee. What is your definition of guarantee? India today wanted to try and nail down a definition if there is something quantifiable here or is this just a political, uh, you know, a political phrase being used in a campaign. Here's what the Prime Minister said. Only someone who has experienced a life of poverty understands that the greatest force propelling a poor person forward in life is their trust, their hope. This faith of the poor is what keeps me going. Modi will put in his all but will not let the trust of his poor brothers and sisters break. Modi's guarantee is not a formula made for winning elections. Modi's guarantee is the trust of the poor. Today, Every poor person in the country knows that Modi will not back down from his duty. Today, every poor person is aware of how political parties in the past have broken their trust. But they also know that Modi's guarantee can be trusted. This trust of the poor also gives me my energy. Even if I completely exhaust myself or push myself over my limit, I will not let this trust 
be violated. Okay, we're going to get some reactions in. The first tranche of questions and their answers have just come in. Uh, I'm joined now by consulting editor Rajdeep Sardesai, Siddharth Zarabi, our managing editor at Business Today. And we've got a whole lot of stuff on the economy also coming up. And Sanjay Jha, formerly of the Congress Party, uh, who uh, is, a, is, a, is a fervent critic of the BJP and the Prime Minister. Rajdeep, starting off with you, uh, the Prime Minister uses the word, you know, the phrase Mili Juli Sarkar three times in that answer when speaking about uh, you know, how he sees the move ahead for 2024. He also talks about how Modi ki guarantees about trust from the poor. How do you assess the answers to those first three questions? The politics subheading, Rajdi. Uh, Shiv, I think the Prime Minister is setting the template for the 2024 elections, much as he did in 2019. He is a nationalist populist leader, a larger than life figure. And he is contrasting what he believes is his leadership and stability versus what he sees as chaos and instability uh, brought in by coalition government. Mm. So he's setting that template as his core narrative. Vote for me because I provide stable leadership. Don't vote for the others because they will provide you uncertain, chaotic leadership. That's where the word Mili Juli Sarkar comes in from 1990. Uh, to 2014 ship for 25 years India did have coalition governments and I think the Prime Minister is trying to contrast the last nine now ten years with uh, in the kind of governments you had uh, over those 25 years where there was an element of uncertainty will Manmohan Singh yes. government complete five years was a question that was often asked particularly between 2004 and 9 and you had uh, uh, governments falling between 96 and 99, you had three different governments. So the prime minister is contrasting stability with chaos on the other side. The Modi ki guarantee is more interesting because he's almost invoking his, per identifying his personal, uh, his personality yes. with the popular will of the people and almost referring to himself in the third person. Ye Modi ki guarantee hai. That prime minister Modi coming from a, poor uh, background, now rising to the top job, mm. understands what it means to be uh, to come out of poverty and thereby understands the hopes and aspirations of the people. So he's tapping into his personal uh, sense of uh, belief, his self-belief, and trying to convey to the people of the country that, look, as long as I am there, you're secure. So it is really... Uh, completely conflating his personality with the will of the people. And that's been his politics as a nationalist populist leader. And he, since it's worked twice before, but in 2014 and 19, he hopes to complete a hat trick. Hmm. The interview comes across, if I may say so, in conclusion, as, as someone who's, who's almost very, very self-confident, I wouldn't say overconfident, but someone who's self-confident that 2024, in his view, is almost a done deal. Okay, very interesting how the Prime Minister says, don't look for a dictionary meaning of guarantee. It's about the trust from the poor. And he says that a couple of times to reinforce that notion. Ashok Malik, partner uh, with the Asia Group, is also with us. Ashok, welcome. We'll be going to our other guests as well in just a moment. Uh, you, know, your, your, uh, you know, your reading of the Prime Minister's uh, fleshing out of this Modi ki guarantee, uh, uh, you know, slogan going into 2024, Ashok, where he says, you know, this kind of a guarantee can only really come from someone who's risen from the ground up. So uh, if you read the interview, which I've, I've read in detail, yes. it's a very good interview. He talks about uh, listening to policy specialists and civil servants and advisors, but also mixing their advice with his own uh, bottom-up experience as a political activist, as a political worker, as somebody who's been in public life and traveled across the country yeah. in various roles for, for 50 or 60 years now. And it's that that magic of that, that chemistry that actually drives his policy making. That's what he attributes it to. Now, this is, this is a gift. This is a, a, a gift that is rare. Mm. And... Uh, that is really the key to the guarantee. He, he talks about it being a commitment and a trust to his voter. Mm. But he's not asking voters to just vote for him because he's nationalist or populist or, or, or identifies with the nation. He's, he's asking people to vote for him because of the strength of his achievements over the past 10 years. And he talks about that in detail. Mm. He, you know, he, the, the most telling number is the inflation number between the 10 years of the UPA government and the 10 years of 
the NDA government. The inflation number is 5.1% uh, for the NDA government, which is half of what it was for the UPA government. And both governments faced international challenges and, and commodity price challenges. And yet, this government has managed inflation better. Yeah. And he's obviously proud of that. He also talked about Ashok, we've lost your audio. I'll just try and patch that back in. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, the yeah, yeah, Ashok, you, I think we have you back. Can you can, uh, finish your point? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So he, he also talks about uh, the risk of a coalition government, the risk of a military sarkar, where the prime minister's writ does not run even to his ministers. Yeah. So when he talks about his strong personality and his his absolute clarity, it's not just because he's talking up himself. Mm. It's also because in a time of such upheaval, Upheaval at home, upheaval internationally, upheaval in the economy, upheaval in geopolitics. You need a strong leader. Very, very interesting. He, that's what he, that's what he offers himself. Absolutely. And, you know, if you read this entire interview and over the next few minutes, I'm going to be reading the rest of the interview out to all of our viewers. I can tell you that it, there is a sense and I agree with Ashok that, you know, not a word is wasted. Each and every word is weighed to carry a certain amount of significance beyond, uh, you know, what's just there in that sentence. Now, let me go to part two and I'll bring in all our other, other guests. Siddharth Zarabi, Sanjay Jha and others will also be joining us. They're both with us. We're getting more people. Raj Jengapa also, who was part of this interview panel, will be with us as well live. Now let's go to the second part two of what the Prime Minister said in this interview to India today. We asked him, how is the BJP different from these so-called Parivar Vadi parties? The reason why this question was asked is because the Prime Minister was asked about how there is this trend of changing leaders every now and then. And the Prime Minister interestingly took his own example to say that the BJP is not like these Parivar Vadi parties. Answering the question, here's what the Prime Minister said in the interview and I quote, Parivar Vadi parties find this democratic churn difficult. The BJP has the ability to nurture multiple generations of leadership at the same time. Look at the presidents of the BJP and you will see fresh faces every few years. Ours is a cadre based party driven by a clear mission. We all began as grassroots workers and rose through the ranks on the back of dedication and hard work. This commitment is why the nation, especially the youth, feels a strong connection with the BJP. In a democracy, it is essential to provide opportunities to new generations and new blood. This democratic churn is what makes democracies vibrant. This churn is also what makes our party vibrant and keeps aspirations and hopes burning within our karyakartas. They feel that they too can rise in the party through their hard work. Our party is used to doing different experiments. In Gujarat, we opted for all fresh faces in ministries. In Delhi, we opted for all fresh faces in local corporation elections." Unquote. Raj Shengapa, Group Editorial Director for Publishing, who conducted this interview, uh, you know, along with Arun Puri and Kali Puri, is also live with us. Raj, welcome to our coverage. And I'll be going to our other guests for a word on this as well. Uh, you know, the, it's interesting, Raj, how the Parivar Vad word, uh, you know, was used by the Prime Minister in response to your question about the trend of, you know, constantly changing faces, new faces. Uh, in the recent Heartland elections, that was also, uh, you know, one of the things that was there. And the Prime Minister, very interestingly, took his own example. He said, look at what happened in 2001, 2002 in Gujarat. Uh, there as well, here, I was made the Chief Minister without any prior administrative experience. So this has been a legacy of the BJP. And the Prime Minister himself, Raj, brings in the word Parivar Vad and that you know, leads to the next question you asked. Very interesting. You know, Shiv, uh, I, I think uh, what he's done in some senses in this interview is uh, laid the grounds for the battle uh, for 2024. Yeah. It's very clear. And he, he, he told us it's performance, which means his performance versus Parivarva. I mean, that was the words he used. Mm. And then went on to talk about how uh, Mili Jili, uh, he wasn't uh, directly referring to the India Alliance. He's very careful about that. But in general, talked about these 30 years of instability that were in, uh, for what he calls these milligilly parties that uh, done. And then talks of uh, the fact that this is, the nation is looking for stability and growth. Mm. And he is the person that was going to do it. But I think what's very interesting about this interview, Shiv, if I may add, is that uh, 
What he does in this interview is, uh, you know, I've talked to him earlier, and so has Arun and Kali. Uh, and um, also, uh, you know, um, when he was uh, just one year in the business yeah. as prime minister. And what the difference I found was that he was willing to talk about um, how his mind works, how he takes decisions. Yes, we'll be you coming know, to that uh, in a moment, in fact. Yeah, sure, sure, please. Yeah, yeah. no, I'll come to that because I, I want to flesh this out so that, you know, we're moving in sequence, Raj. So just bear with me. We'll be coming to that sure. bit also. The Parivarvad issue also, I wanted to flesh out a little bit more and get Rajdeep and Sanjay in on this. Rajdeep, the Parivarvad issue is something... Uh, you know, we've seen used plentifully. It's not a new barb that has been used by the BJP or the Prime Minister uh, to attack the opposition. How do you see it in the current context just weeks before the next election? You know, Shiv, the template the Prime Minister has set is more or less identical over the last few years. If you look at it, uh, Majboor Sarkar versus what he says is a Majboor Sarkar. Hmm. A strong government versus coalition governments. He uses the word Mili Juli here. Uh, you've seen his claim of Modi ki guarantee, trying to rip, uh, get people to uh, to vote for the Prime Minister, not necessarily the BJP, but have trust in the Prime Minister when he makes a commitment. And the same with Parivarwad. What mm. is he doing? He's essentially contrasting his claim that he and his party represent, he believes, a certain meritocracy versus his rivals, especially in the India Alliance, many regional parties, as well as the Congress Party, his principal adversary, yeah. which he wants to suggest are family courts. So this has been the template the Prime Minister has set uh, over the last decade. And he's simply following that on primarily because I don't think the opposition has been able to offer an alternative narrative which is compelling enough. Because they've not been able to offer that alternative narrative, the Prime Minister knows he's sticking to his game. Hmm. This has been his game plan. The others have to now find something new to disrupt the Prime Minister's game plan. And because they've not been able to do that successfully enough yet, he is someone who is sticking to, uh, to the very template that enabled him uh, to achieve success in 2019. He it's... mentioned Parivarvad then. He's mentioning it now again. S Sanjay, do you want to, you know, add something to that? You know, the Parivarvada attack is not new. Uh, and the fact that the Prime Minister is still uses it in his interviews and speeches and rallies suggests that there's been no effective counter to that. We've seen the opposition, the Congress especially, try and say, look who's talking. The BJP has its own dynasties, etc., etc. But that has never really found any traction or credibility in the same way that it does when the Prime Minister points a finger at the Congress party and says, Parivarvat. Uh, Shiv, you have a point there. I think the the opposition has not been able to actually give a rejoinder, especially when uh, Mr. Modi's party actually has Maneka Gandhi and Varun Gandhi, two famous Gandhis who are part of the BJP. So, mm. and if you have the long list of people from Piyush Goyal down to Devendra Fadnavis, etc., there are more dynastic leaders today in the BJP than the Congress. But you're, you're absolutely right. This point needs to be articulated. But I have a couple of short points here to make if mr modi is indeed you know uttering you know these lovely platitudes to your newspaper why isn't he holding a press conference why why for example would he hesitate from addressing the media and the public at large why isn't this interview or where we are talking about his quotes playing out on on the camera on india today no, but so we've I asked him every question in this interview as you will see yeah, yeah. So, so let, let me make a few points. Mm. I think it lacks credibility to a great extent. And, you know, his guarantee or whatever, I think these are standard trope. Uh, anyone with a discerning eye will know that, you know, frankly speaking, he said nothing new at all. But there are two points I wish to make because I heard, I think, uh, I don't know, Ashok say about growth. Do people know that in the last four years or rather five years since 2019, India's GDP has been just 3.5%. That is India's GDP. And therefore, the logic why the opposition keeps talking about and this government runs away from it on unemployment, on food inflation in particular, on the farmer distress. L look at the four factors that Narendra Modi talked about as his big quote, right? My four casts are poverty. Do you know the number of people below poverty line today? At a very conservative estimate, it's around 250 million. Okay. Farmers, he talked about farmers. We saw what the farmers went through for a one-year-long strike and what were the consequences of that. He talks of youth, 
Look at the unemployment there. And he talks of women. Look at Sakshi Malik episode to look at how we treat women in this country and how Mr. Modi has protected his own BGP leader. So I think let's cut out this, you know, shibboleths and slogans. Bottom line, I believe this has been a dark decade. I hope the people of India are able to see through it. But I'll agree with you. It's up to the Congress and the India Alliance to be able to change the narrative. Okay. If they do, I still think we have a story in 2024. Ashok, you want to come in? You want to say something on that? Look, two things here. One, uh, I've spoken about inflation, not growth, but uh, I'll take I'll take the larger point that uh, uh, that uh, uh, has been made, and I'd like to answer that. Uh, I think uh, this has been, especially the past four years, have been a very, very challenging period for the global economy, not just the Indian economy, the global economy. Every budget that Mr. Modi's second government has come up with has, has to be reworked because of global challenges. The COVID pandemic, uh, the Russia-Ukraine war, uh, uh, the 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 uh, the lockdown, the yeah. uh, the the, imp the geopolitical impact of the China-U.S. Uh, breakdown. A number of issues have come up, and now, of course, the Middle Eastern war. So every single budget almost has had to be reworked and relooked at. And yet, through this period. I think food inflation has been managed fairly well. I'm not suggesting it's been perfect, but it's been mm. managed fairly well. His record on inflation is better than the UPS, with due respects. And in, okay. in terms of growth, in terms of restructuring the economy, uh, believe me, I work with business now, and I'm hearing and seeing more interest in manufacturing now than previously. Okay. And this is I... not to say previous governments did not try. And this is not to say it's all been done and everything has been achieved. It's a long, multi-year, multi-decade process to make India a manufacturing economy. But you're seeing the beginnings of that now. If you look at infrastructure and logistics, the improvement in the past 10 years is astounding. And that is a building block to a, a, a deeper manufacturing economy going ahead. I I'm glad we're talking about economy. I will come to you, Sanjay. I saw your finger noted. I'll come to you just after the next couple of questions. Uh, uh, glad we're talking about the economy because the next batch of questions that Raj, uh, uh, Mr. Puri and Kali asked the Prime Minister were on the issue of economy and the challenges facing the country. The Prime Minister said in the interview that during this year, we've seen many successes as well as challenges. He was asked what exactly these challenges were to articulate them, to which the Prime Minister's reply was, and I quote, India's rapid ascent in 2023 has been very important as it sets the tone in our journey to Viksit Bharat. We've unleashed the latent potential of our nation on global forums. India's presence and contributions are now sought after. From a country that used to feel left behind, we have become a country that is now leading from the front. From a country that used to seek a voice on various platforms, we've become a country that leads and creates new global platforms. Today, the world consensus is clear. This is India's moment. This led to our next question to the Prime Minister. How are you, the Prime Minister, ensuring that India becomes a $5 trillion economy and the world's third largest? Remember, the $5 trillion economy is a promise that the Prime Minister and the BJP government have made. Here is the Prime Minister's answer. And I quote, our track record speaks for itself. When I became chief minister of Gujarat in 2001, the size of its economy was around $26 billion. When I left Gujarat to become the prime minister, the size of Gujarat's economy had become $133.5 billion. And as a result of the various policies and reforms, today Gujarat's economy is around $260 billion. Similarly, when I became Prime Minister in 2014, the size of India's economy was $2 trillion. And at the end of 2023-24, India's GDP will be more than $3.75 trillion dollars. It is this track record of 23 years which shows this is a realistic target. Raj, I want to come to you on this because the five trillion dollar economy has become a very, very sticky catchphrase. We've seen, uh, you know, uh, quite a bit of heat in the media recently, uh, 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 you know, over whether this can happen, it won't happen. There is, you know, there have been empirical counters. There have been those who've said it can definitely happen given India's track record over the past couple of years. This is something. Uh, uh, you know, which is quantifiable. It's not just a promise. It's an actual arithmetic number to which the government can actually be held to. But the prime minister is sticking with it, Raj. 
I think he took two tracks. One, of course, he kept his, to his commitment that he would fulfill it and sort of uh, show, you know, told us that his past record shows that he has kept his word on uh, on these these kind of issues. Very interestingly, you had mentioned Vixit Bharat. Mm. And I think in the interview, he went really in depth into what he thinks of Vixit Bharat. And he, he told us that, uh, look, it is not about per capita income. That you see, if you if you look at the common definition of uh, what a developed country is, they, they talk of per capita income being about $20,000 or yes. so, uh, around $2,000 uh, to have a world, world class infrastructure, as well as uh, to have a society that is governed by democracy. Mm. These are three or four of the attributes. His, uh, uh, his point was that, look, there are over 100 characteristics that you need to talk about when you look at what a developed country would be like. And he went a little more into that and he said there are three or four things I'd like to do in the next couple of years. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, before I, I, I get into that detail, talk very interestingly of the fact that between 1922 and 1947, mm. there was an Indian, Indian uh, 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 generation in India that aspired for freedom. And in that aspiration, they fulfilled that thing. He now sees a period between 2023 and 2047 where there's a whole new generation that aspires to be a developed country. Yes. And therefore, he, his, his faith is that uh, this is this generation that is going to change that, has the will and the power to do it. Very interesting. And then he talks about three, three things that he would like to do in this Vixit Bharat process. One is he looks at skill development and he brings in the new education policy to say that he's uh, changing the way that yeah. you know, this is a problem-solving problem generation. The second thing he says is that he would like to encourage medium-sized and small businesses and make them grow into larger in enterprises and therefore build the foundation of this 2047 development. And the third aspect he identifies is that the financial markets, he says yeah. investment is key to it and there has to be a restructuring of it. So it is not a kind of a woolly notion that he talks about Vixen Bharat. Mm. I think for the first time he actually elaborates. Uh, let's also be clear, Shiv, even as we speak, uh, the Niti Ayog has been, and which we mentioned in our article, is working on a, a, you know, a blueprint for Vixit Bharat. There are 10 secretarial groups that have been formed. Okay. And they have uh, you know, brainstormed for the last three or four months. And that proposal, I am told, is going to be put on the new year to the Prime Minister. Okay. So he is giving flesh and bones to what uh, he, you know, uh, he, he's talked about in the last couple of months. Okay, very, very interesting. So not woolly, definitely a lot of flesh and bone, a lot of structure to what is going on. Siddharth Zarabi, uh, Managing Editor Business Today, also with us. Siddharth, this is something you've been looking at uh, you know, ever since that whole $5 trillion economy uh, declaration kind of exploded upon the political landscape. How are you seeing the mood right now as far as that promise is concerned and what the Prime Minister has just said? Well, very clearly, uh, the Prime Minister in his interview has given us a glimpse not only into his 2024 agenda, which is election year, but a broader five-year blueprint. And it's very interesting, the kind of economic roadmap, and that's the bulk of crux of his argument, really, uh, is evolving around two or three pillars. Mm. One, sustained economic growth, GDP growth, and a very clear-cut statement that there will continue to be reforms because you know a lot of the times this government is uh, uh, is asked about reforms as they were understood earlier and mm. he very clearly says preparing india's financial sector and capital into uh, markets and the regulatory framework so if you look at some of these key points the second part very clearly is the continuing fo focus on the small and medium enterprises yes. rather refer to that and third most importantly shiv is a clear indication that infrastructure will continue to drive growth and answer critics like Sanjay Jha. Okay, very interesting. And I'll get Sanjay Jha in on this because yeah, we're, like to respond we're, to that. we're taking, yeah, I, I'm just coming to you, Sanjay, because the, the next question that uh, uh, was asked to the Prime Minister brings it down to that issue that you and Ashok were just talking about, which is inflation and jobs. So let me just put that out and then I'm coming straight to you. Now, the next question, the uh, opposition says experts say that inflation and lack of jobs is hurting the poor what would you say to these critics is the question that was put to the prime minister to which his response to india today was and i quote let's put allegations aside and discuss the facts despite two years of a once in a century pandemic 
and global conflicts disrupting global value chains and even causing recessionary pressures across the world, India has shown remarkable resilience. Despite heavy odds, global crises, supply chain breakdowns and geopolitical tensions impacting global prices of basic items, average inflation from 2014-2015 to 2023-24 till November was only 5.1% compared to 8.2% during the previous 10 years, that is 2004 to 2014. Which is higher, inflation of 5.1% or 8.2% is what the Prime Minister says. Let's just, let's just decode that for a moment because this is the, uh, you know, this is the very emotive issue of inflation, price rise and job creation. Sanjay, I want to quickly come to you on that because you had your finger raised. Let's get a first word from you. The Prime Minister there says, put aside the allegations, let's just compare the numbers, which is higher, 8.1 or 5, 8.2 or 5.1, Sanjay? But Shiv, let me tell the Prime Minister, because I hope he's watching your program right now, he will do so later. Inflation and growth have to be talked concurrently, okay? Now, the, now the, the, he's dodging the real fundamental issue, because when you look at the UPA's track record, he talks of COVID. Well, the UPA had the Great Recession, the mortgage crisis, that was the worst after the Great Depression, number one. Number two, the UPA's growth rate, if you look at UPA 1, was over 8.5%. This government, and this is, by the way, in the old GDP calculation method. So there is no comparison between the GDP growth during UPA 1 and UPA 2, although the last two years were not very good. Yet the government of Mr. Modi inherited a 6.4% GDP in 2014. Okay. And in the last five years, they were given you 3.5%. Number two, you know, I think somebody mentioned about the five trillion economy. Let me tell you straight why that is such a huge smoke screen. Simple arithmetic, anybody can calculate that. If at 3.75 trillion, you know, to get to five trillion, you need just 10% nominal growth shift. What is 10% nominal growth? A GDP of 6% and 4% inflation can get you to 5 trillion. You don't need a Narendra Modi, you don't need a Rahul Gandhi. Anybody on this panel, even my, my junior most management trainee, if he's the prime minister, should be able to get you 5 trillion. This is all nothing but hype and exaggeration. Okay. You look at the mechanics here. You need basic GDP of 6% to get there. And a 4% inflation. Okay. What's a big story? S Siddharth and Ashok have their fingers up. Uh, Siddharth? You want to counter that? Well, uh, you know, very quickly, 6.4% in the outgoing year of uh, Manmohan Singh. And I wonder why Sanjay forgets 2016-17, uh, a growth of 8.26%. Uh, and and this repeated. Now, uh, uh, you know, I didn't interrupt you, Sanjay. And if you look at inflation, it's very clear. And I have all those numbers here with me, Shiv. But to save on time, from a 9.4% inflation inherited from uh, Manmohan Singh to 6.6 percent, including the shock years. But the larger point is, as far as looking at an average post-COVID or trying to compare it with 2008, which was a huge deflationary uh, shock and did not follow with a supply shock, as we have seen, is plain wrong economics. So, you know, we can discuss politics, uh, but that's not the correct answer. Absolute. Ashok, Ashok, you want to add to that? Just uh, two points uh, to what Sanjay said. One, uh, I'll just pick on pick up on uh, the crisis this government faced with COVID and the crisis the UPA government faced with uh, the global financial crisis uh, of 2008, which Sanjay referred to. Uh, the responses of both governments are telling. This government did not splurge money. It it doubled down on infrastructure spending, on on building the economy for the future on, on uh, creating a roadmap for a longer term sustainable growth. Mm. The UPA government in the same, say in a similar crisis, went on a, a binge and uh, gave loans to cronies, gave loans to people who did not deserve those loans and put our banks into a crisis which took a, a good part of a decade for them to come out of. So that, that comparison is there for all to see. The second point. Shiv, a quick rejoinder. Yes, Sanjay. A quick just, rejoinder. I'll come to you, Sanjay. I'll come to you. Look, can I finish, Sanjay, please? I have not interrupted. You let me finish, please. Okay, so the second point. Yes, if you make me prime minister, Sanjay prime minister, anybody prime minister, the economy at some point will reach 5 trillion and at some point will reach 10 trillion. I agree. That is not the point here. In, in the mid-2030s, India's GDP will be 
uh, about 10 trillion dollars. Mr. Modi says uh, by the early 2030s, mm. uh, maybe 2035, right? Now, the question is today our economy is three, our GDP is 3.8 trillion dollars with manufacturing at 14 percent. Mr. Modi is saying make it 10 trillion with manufacturing of 25 percent. That is the key question. Will we reach 10 trillion with 25 percent manufacturing or 14, 15 percent manufacturing? That is the key question. And what has he done towards achieving that? He has worked okay. on infrastructure. He has worked on logistics, not complete work in progress, but he's working on it, Gati Shakti. He's worked on digitization of the economy and, and society. He's worked on manufacturing incentives through the PLI scheme. He's worked on formalization of the economy through GST and other measures. He's worked on foreign policy and diplomacy leading to technology partnerships with countries that can contribute to our manufacturing, mm. especially in defense and electronics and semiconductors, such as the US and Japan. This is what, this is the long-term plan okay. he's working towards. Sa Sanjay, I'll come to you in just a moment. I just wanted to broaden a little bit because we've got a little seconds. bit more on economy. And I... Just give me 30 seconds. Okay, okay. Quick, just quick, quick seconds. one, quick rebuttal. Yeah. Ashok, look at after all the hype over make in India, what is the manufacturing component in India's GDP? Nothing over 10 years. It's a lost and a dark decade of economic losses. Number two, if really India had grown, 56% of Indian families need to be given five kilograms of food grains to subsist. What are we talking about? Okay, okay. You've made, you, you've made that point. I'll, I, I, both Siddharth and Ashok, I'll give a chance to rebut after the next question that we ask. But before I go to the next question that we ask the Prime Minister, I want to bring Rajdeep also in on this. Rajdeep, you know, economic distress, unemployment, job creation, inflation, uh, you know, have been... Have been uh, have been steady, you know, issues at rallies. They, they were heard during the Karnataka election. They were heard during the Telangana election in the heartland as well. The prime minister in this answer says, you know, put aside these allegations. Let's just talk about the facts. From a political perspective, how is that looking just weeks before this next election? Acknowledging that economic distress is an issue. Look, the fact is, I've heard two varying point, viewpoints on your panel between those who seem to see the glass as half full and those who see the glass as half empty. And both are true. Let's be very clear. It's not as if everything is milk and honey there in the economy. These, these have been very tough years. Post-demonetization, post-GST, post-COVID, India has shown resilience, no doubt about it. But there have been ups and downs and lots of people have hurt. And I think we have to acknowledge that. You know, to simply all the time either talk up the economy or on the other hand claim, you know, economic distress is widespread. Both these arguments, I think, do not reflect the truth. The truth has always lies somewhere in between these two extremes. The opposition seems to believe nothing has happened hmm. in the last 10 years uh, as far as the government is concerned, which is a complete falsehood. On the other hand, uh, the government cheerleaders seem to believe that India has miraculously changed post-2014 which is also not true. I mean, let me give you basics. Issues like paper leaks. I mean, structure, you know, the prime minister, uh, while he is absolutely right in, you know, in tapping into aspirational India, also needs to recognize the potential demographic disaster that lies out there. Government recruitment exams in state after state are not conducted on time. Lacks of students are struggling, therefore, to even get jobs. And they want government jobs, not to see private sector jobs, because there are states where private sector is not pulling in its weight. Hmm. Now, these are real issues on the ground. You see, I think there is a need for a reality check for both sides. Okay. The opposition needs a reality check to understand the impact, for example, that digitization has made, that GST uh, has made on the ground. But the government also needs to recognize the fact that small and micro enterprises have hurt. They need to recognize that government exams are shoddily run with corruption running right through them. They've got to recognize that cronyism still exists right through our system. I mean, these are two sides. I wish between a Siddharth Zarabi and Sanjay Jha, we could find a middle ground or between an Ashok and a Sanjay. And I think the failure at the moment in our political discourse is that we are not willing to acknowledge our faults. We are only willing, you know, either side is working in extremes and that reflects the polarities. I wish we could have a more realistic assessment of where we are today. Okay. You know, we are trumping, uh, if you listen to the Modi cheerleaders, they will only trumpet uh, the positives. If you listen to the, uh, the naysayers, they will only look at India uh, uh, heading towards disaster. The truth is that it lies somewhere in between. And I wish there was a more realistic assessment 
rather than what we are seeing at the moment, which are two extreme perspectives, neither of which I think reflect the reality on the ground. Uh, Siddharth, do you want to do you, do you want to answer that or add to that? Glass half full, glass half empty is what Rajdeep says. This is well. Well, that would that would be true for all economies, including China, which has enjoyed the fruits of a thirty-year-old manufacturing boom. And uh, you know, if we take several examples, and no one's talked about it, I'll just leave you with one example. Uh, Ten years of UPA rule and the amount of back and forth that happened on petroleum subsidies. Please acknowledge, and since politics is dominating this discussion, although this has a solid economic core to it, uh, would you not agree that this government has demonstrated political nerves of steel when it has come to oil price management, including buying from Russia or ensuring that post-COVID prices for the last uh, so many months have been kept uh, stable and now with some sort of dividend, possibly a price cut is in the offing and a decision could be announced very soon. I think we need to keep this in mind and being boxed into a position for and against. That's not my mandate. But it's very clear that as far as economic management is concerned, I once again reiterate what I'm reading from this interview and the previous interview that we got around the G20 at business today with the uh, Prime Minister. It's clear that the Prime Minister is telling us that the next agenda of his will sorely focus around uh, the youth, the term that he uses, Gyan, mm. youth and the Annadata and Nari Shakti. Those are the three pillars that he is going to focus on 2024 and beyond. And Shiv, you know that the recent speech where he completely focused on the youth. Absolutely. Okay. No, no, but you see the youth, you know, Siddharth, the youth, I agree with you. I mean, the fact is the Prime Minister's success has been that he's been able to create this aspirational society that looks for a better future among the youth. But travel across the country and look at state after state, whereas I gave the example of paper leaks, in government, including in the Prime Minister's home state of Gujarat, where there are lakhs of students who have not been therefore able to get the jobs that they were promised because government recruitment exams Ra are... Ra 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 I mean, these are the... the you see, it's time, it's time Siddharth, that we got out of studios and did some reality checks on the ground. That's my only point. You know, let's not believe that India is a land of milk and honey. Let's not also believe that India is all doom and gloom. The truth lies in should between, we, my friend. Should, should we move education out of the concurrent list into the central list and let central agencies run all of this to fix those loopholes? No, no. Shifts, you know, Siddharth, that, that, that's the point, the I want to answer that. There are, structural, there are basic structural problems that need to be addressed. I'm sure the Prime Minister is concerned about it. I believe he is. I believe that state governments need to be also held to account. And I think these are the issues on the ground, which sometimes our policy makers do not recognize when they talk the right talk. Okay. The platitudes, the talk, you know, talking about youth, who's not going to... Do? Everybody knows India's biggest challenge as well as opportunity is the young of India. But are we doing enough for them? Is skill development done enough? These are questions that need to be asked, Siddharth. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Now let's move to the next, the next subsection. We've dealt with the elections. We've dealt with what's going to happen in 2024. Now let's talk a little bit about uh, something that's very close to my heart, which is national security. This is the domain that I operate in. Here's the question that the Prime Minister was asked. You had famously said, this is not an era of war. Apart from Ukraine, the Gaza war and other mini conflicts are raging. India played a deft balancing act through these crises. Is there a Modi way out of this global disorder. And here's what the Prime Minister said in response uh, to India Today's question. He said, and I quote, I have always believed that honest dialogue and sincere diplomacy in an atmosphere free from fear and coercion should be the preferred path to resolve differences, be it Ukraine or Gaza. Our approach has been guided by this belief. We cannot let terrorists or violence set the agenda. Those who had no role in causing conflicts are often the most affected by them, either directly or indirectly. Giving primacy to diplomacy does not mean that we compromise when it comes to terrorism and territorial sovereignty. We also asked the Prime Minister, what about dealing with our neighbors, especially Pakistan, and China, China, of course, the country with which India has a massive military standoff for the fourth year running. The Prime Minister said, and I quote, the Modi way of dealing with our neighbours is to be constructive and cooperative when required and equally to be firm and steadfast when needed, both on initiatives and challenges. You can see the difference with the past. So this is 
uh, we asked the Prime Minister about... Uh, okay, so we'll, 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 we'll come to the Prime Minister's way of doing things uh, uh, in the next segment. But let me get Raj Jengapa back in on this because uh, Raj, national security also very close to your heart. The Prime Minister, you know, giving the uh, uh, very, very relevant examples of how uh, India navigated both the recent Israel-Hamas issue as well as the Ukraine issue from two years ago, uh, you know, using them as examples of the Modi way or the India way of navigating, you know, prickly, shape-shifting global international issues at a time when India is seeking international space for itself. I think he made three or four significant points uh, in this. And uh, uh, so, and I say very important points. He, he pushed for uh, dialogue uh, and diplomacy as a three key to, uh, you know, and he called it honest and sincere mm. and free from, uh, you know, terror and concern and fear and uh, coercion. That's what he used, the, the terms that he used. Now, I, I think there there is something that uh, when he speaks, when he said this is not an era of war, it had a tremendous impact in terms of where India stood on this particular issue. He then nuances this in the, in the second part. If you if you care, study it very carefully, he talks about the fact that uh, uh, just, uh, you know, the diplomacy alone, you know, he's, he's, he's putting into context. It doesn't mean that uh, terrorism and, uh, you know, any violation of territorial integrity would be permitted. Hmm. He said that is not what we are, what I'm getting at. Uh, that, you know, that will continue it is, and that is, I think that very subtle nuance is, is, is there. That, uh, and, and he's referring clearly, of course, to yes. China on one side and to Pakistan on the other, that we are not going to enter into diplomacy with you, uh, you know, uh, just because uh, of these factors that I've talked about. I, have, I would have discussed Ukraine and also Gaza, but when it comes to our interest, this is what will be guiding it. Mm. And I think he also made a very interesting point when he talked about neighbors. He didn't want to name names in the interview, though we had actually specifically asked him about yes, Pakistan, Pakistan and China. China. And uh, I think the words he used was firm stand. Yeah. And that policy is being played out right now. I, the, the focus, I think, of his is that if you're not going to do the kind of, you know, I am willing to be open, as we saw in the first term of Prime Minister Modi, where he did go across to Lahore, try to build relations with Pakistan. China, he spent a lot of time investing and, uh, you know, meeting Xi Jinping. Yes. But if you're not going to go down that path, we will be firm about it. And I think the focus, I'm, you know, he's not going to say it directly to us, is to build our strength. Yes. And not just military strength. You know, he, he also understands uh, that, you know, we are not building a war machine. Hmm. Uh, we defend ourselves on this. But to ensure that, you know, we speak from a position of strength, both economic and military, that, I think, is the path he's indicating, though he may not have specifically said that in this interview. Okay, very interesting. Uh, Ashok, uh, if I could bring you in on this as well, on the national security question, where he said, uh, you know, uh, uh, the Modi way of dealing with our neighbours is to be constructive and cooperative when required, but also to be firm and steadfast when required, uh, and, uh, you know, to suggest that both of these stands have been demonstrated by, uh, you know, Prime Minister Modi's leadership in dealing with either Pakistan or China, even though he didn't take their names. So, a uh, couple of points here, uh, uh, Shiv. One, uh, if you look at the approach to, to Pakistan and China, where in the face of challenges, uh, this government has been fairly resolute. It has not always achieved what it wanted to, but it has never shied away from trying. Uh, whether it is in terms of actually m mobilizing hundreds, uh, over 100,000 troops to the Ch uh, Ladakh border to match Chinese mobilization, uh, to improving border infrastructure with China. Again, not a, not a done deal. I'm not suggesting, unlike what Rajiv accuses me of, that there's been a miracle. It's a, a gradual, steady, but determined effort to, Im to improve and match what China has done over decades. Uh, but it's a work in progress. And on Pakistan, the fact that there has been no terror attack on uh, Indian soil or Indian asset outside, very unfortunately, Jammu and Kashmir in the past few years, is certainly something this government can take a quiet pride in. Uh, but of course, I have to touch wood there and hope nothing goes wrong in the future. Uh, second, what this government and what Mr. Modi have done is they actually the first in our country in a long time to talk about yeah. composite national power. Economic power, including capacities to build at home, 
to have some uh, resilience with domestic sourcing in, in defense production, in key technologies, in electronics manufacture, mm. in building leverage and not the building dependencies vis-a-vis -vis China in, in these key commodities and key technologies, and further modernizing the, the military. Very, very and, and building defense infra border infrastructure. So you're talking about composite national power, which is where the Chinese have spoken about for two decades. This so is... this is the first time in this government I've been hearing policymakers, ministers, senior civil servants talk about composite national power. That is the big change in terms of the approach to security. Okay, very interesting. And this new because, approach... Because to security sec today is not just guns and tanks and bombers. Oh, absolutely. There's, there's or fighters. It's, it's also supply chains. Absolutely, no doubt about it's it. It's also technology. Yeah, yeah. Very, 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 very important perspective on this. Sanjay, you wanted to just add to this on this national security issue? Yeah, uh, three short points. Uh, I do believe there's been a lot of opacity on China. Number two, on Gaza, I thought this government jumped the gun. In fact, given the fact that India had a good relationship with the Palestinians, there was an opportunity for India to actually be an effective troubleshooter. It would have been a great opportunity for India to take some kind of a leadership of the global south that was thrown away. Because I think the problem with Mr. Modi's government, largely driven by his personality, is to leverage foreign policy largely for the domestic audience. I know all political leaders see an opportunity, they try and exploit it, but I think Mr. Modi's government goes bizarrely over the top. The last point that we should not ignore, I think India and all of us are, all, all of us believe in a law and order situation internationally and domestically. The criticism that has come of late, that we are actually attacking separatists or terrorists abroad and killing them and therefore now inviting international uh, you know, kind of disapproval is a matter of serious concern. You know, it is all right to display this muscular nationalism on domestic soil, but these are things that have a larger long-term ramification. But, for but India Sanjay, India conflict. isn't isn't displaying any muscular nationalism on this issue. It has set up a committee, uh, you know, in response to these questions. There has been a difference in how India has approached allegations from Canada and the United States, but surely you aren't suggesting that India should be bending over backwards uh, you know, when allegations uh, which are uh, deemed to be completely untrue are made by a foreign power, especially countries that are uh, alleged to be, uh, you know, interfering with our internal affairs. But let's just leave that point aside for a moment because that's a separate debate which we've been doing a lot yeah. of here on India yeah. today because we're almost out of time. And I, I'm told by our producers we have time just for that last uh, segment, which is where we asked the Prime Minister on a personal note uh, you know, you've been in key leadership posts for over 22 years, whether as a chief minister and now as a prime minister. What would you say have been the key lessons that you have learned, the mantras of your success? It's a, it's a, it's a question that the prime minister is asked often. And the reason for that is the answer is always interesting. Here's what the prime minister said in response to India Today's question. And I quote, my successes are in the public domain and so are my efforts. So people are free to deduce mantras of success. The one thing that I have adhered to is nation first. Everything I have done as a karyakarta, as a chief minister and as a prime minister, I have always put the nation first. Every decision I've taken has been taken with the national interest in mind. Often people ask me how about, uh, about how I took a difficult decision. For me, it does not seem difficult as I take all my decisions through the prism of nation first. So that's the final segment of the interview that we have done with the Prime Minister. Quick final round of uh, comments and reactions on this. Uh, Raj, to you first. Nation first is my prism, says the Prime Minister, for any and all decisions. Ashiv, let's give uh, Mr. Modi credit for being one of the most decisive Prime Ministers and taking very tough decisions. We've seen that in Kashmir. Uh, we've seen him, of course, uh, you know, in, in other areas like women's reservation, move, pushing through a bill that had been pending for a long time, seen that in terms of his attack, uh, the, both in uh, Yuri as well as, you know, Balakot. So he has taken the, uh, the call. He has bit the bullet on many, many occasions. Yeah. What is interesting about this is beyond, I mean, we had also in other questions asked him about uh, the way he takes decision. And there, I think, is it's a very revealing answer. He says... Uh, everyone thinks, you know, he's been accused by the opposition of being authoritarian, centralized, the PMO takes all the calls. Uh, he gave a three-step, uh, uh, you know, 
process where he arrives at a decision. He says, firstly, I, I, I have what he, what he calls ground connect. He ha actually comes from a background of yeah. poverty. He has mingled with a lot of people. And he understands this psyche of the Indian, uh, you know, particularly the rural and uh, the needy that are there. So he comes with that thing. Then secondly, he has uh, a lot of uh, experts come and talk to him. And, you know, I will tell him uh, various uh, points of view on that. Okay. And then uh, what he, he also points to what he called a live reality, where he has actually seen all these things in process. And he says he puts these three things together mm. and takes it. I think it's one of the few times you are seeing inside the mind of uh, Narendra Modi and how he takes some of those toughest decisions. Okay. What he told us through the prism of nationalism, as well as how he operates and takes those decisions. It's very rare to see a prime minister make those kind of statements okay. as a, how he arrives at decisions. Okay, and uh, that's a great note to end on because Nation First is something that we take very seriously here on India Today as well. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Raj. Sanjay, Siddharth, Ashok and Rajdeep for joining me on this. Uh, remember that what we've shown you uh, on this show today uh, is uh, uh, excerpts from the Prime Minister's interview for that full interview by Raj, uh, Mr. Puri and Kali. You'll have to read the India Today magazine. It's also, of course, online. That full issue is already on stands. It's online as well. And you can, of course, watch this show on social media. Thanks very much for watching. To all our guests, the news, of course, continues right here on India Today. Stay with us. Today TV dominates 2023. A year of non stop news breaks. They have claimed that they have 40 MLAs on their side. You just Out heard those sounds of the blast. Leading from the front in a world at war. India today reports from the front lines at the Gaza border. Uninterrupted setting of national agenda, insight, credibility, and unmatched perspective. Maximum experience equals maximum viewership, India's maximum channel.